All right, now, the metazoan tissues are highly organized at the cellular level. So they're highly organized, and this organization is even at the cellular level. This organization makes different uh, diversity of anatomical design possible. What does it mean? Now, uh, there are different organs in the metazoan body, in an animal's body, and uh, they, have they have totally different structures because they possess totally different functions. So this depends on organization of the cells, having different cell phenotypes and organizing them in special architectures. The metazoan body is possible only doing this. Diversity even at the level of individual cells. So you can see diversity even at the individual cell level. So there are hundreds of different cell phenotypes in your body, in every single, in every animal's body. Great, uh, great autonomy and versatility at the cellular level is also exists. So we can see this versatility, which means differences in individual cells. And those cells are autonomous. They work together, but also they can behave by themselves. So that, but that have to be regulated. That have to be under regulation, under control. Most types of cells in the metazoan body carry a complete genome of the organism. Okay, you know this. So every single cell has the complete genome of your, what? Your genotype. Every single cell has a complete genome. So you have a complete genome in every single cell of your body. Far more information than any one of these cells will ever require. So uh, that's a lot of information which you will not use for every cell. Every cell uses only a small percentage of this information in the genotype, in genome, in the genetic material. The uh, best example, in the human proteome, do you remember how many proteins in general human proteome total? 100,000 different proteins. We have 100,000 different proteins. But the average one cell uh, or every cell type have around 20,000 different types of protein. So in your total body or your genome knows or your genome contains information for making 100,000 different types of proteins, but one cell has only 20,000 different proteins. So, uh, the cell doesn't use the information for making the other 80,000 proteins. Most cells retain the ability to grow and divide. That's another thing. And also, most of the cells retain the ability to grow and divide long after organismic development has been completed. So, uh, we don't say, okay, we have completed our development, we are adults now, our cells are not going to divide anymore. Some of the cells stop dividing after embryonic development, but some of them keep dividing. So, the, no, the cells also know how to divide. This retained ability to proliferate makes the maintenance of adult tissues possible. So why do we need it? Once we become adults, why do we need to divide our cells? Now, that is necessary, that is necessary for maintenance of our body and repair the wounds. So, this maintenance, I mean with the maintenance, repair of the wounds and replacement of cells that have suffered attrition after extended period of service. At the same time, this versatility and autonomy pose a danger. Those individual cells within the organism may gain access to information in their genomes that is normally denied to them. They can assume roles that are inappropriate for normal tissue maintenance and function. 
The genomic sequence of these cells are subjected to corruption by various mechanisms, which are called mutations. Mutations alter the structure and information content of the genome. So you remember, mutation is the any kind of change in the uh, genome. So your cells, every single cell in your body knows how to divide, actually. It has the information. But normally, this information is denied to those cells. Those cell, uh, normal cells do not have access uh, to information about how cell, cell division, how mitosis is done. But in some cases, uh, those cells lose their ability to control their uh, uh, division, cell division, and they start dividing. Normally, they don't have to divide. So they change the role. They take a new role. They start dividing. And this uncontrolled division of cells cows losing the normal tissue maintenance, losing the uh, tissue maintenance and losing the normal tissue architecture. And also this loss of cell division may be accompanied by mutation. While they are increasing in numbers, while they are increasing their numbers, they can also have changes in their genome. Mutations alter structure and information content of genome. The resulting mutated gene may divert cells into acquiring novel, often highly abnormal phenotypes. So these changes in the genome may cause abnormal phenotypes, which we don't see in the normal cells. Such changes may be incompatible with the normally assigned roles of these cells in organismic structure and physiology. So, remember, every cell has a function in the tissue, and every tissue has a function in the organ. Uh, by this way, every uh, tissue has a function in your body. So, every cell has a function in your body. To do this, you have to keep a structure, because function is dependent on structure. If you change the structure, if you lose the structure, usually that affects the function. Among these inappropriate changes, alterations in cellular proliferation programs. These in turn can lead to appearance of large populations of the cells that no longer obey the rules governing normal tissue constru constructions and maintenance. When portrayed in this way, the cells that form a tumor are the result of normal development gun avery. Right. Extraordinary safeguards are taken by organism to prevent appearance of these cells. So in the normal cells, normally in our bodies, uh, we have protections against these uncontrolled cells. But cancer, cancer cells learn how to bypass those safeguards or protections. Normal cells are carefully programmed to collaborate with one another. Normal cells construct the diverse tissues, diverse tissues that make organismic survival possible. So tissues are made by the cells and existence of those tissues, because of those tissues, since we have those tissues, we are able to live as multicellular organisms. But cancer cells, have a quite different and more focused agenda. What do they do? What's in their agenda? Yes. Cancer cells are motivated by only one consideration, making more copies of themselves. Tumors are monoclonal growth. So what are those tumors? Let's look at the structure of those tumors in a bit more detail. Tumors are monoclonal growths. What does it mean? <coughs> Questions how many normal cells are the ancestors of those cells that congregate to form a tumor? Do the tumor cells descend from a single ancestral cell that cross over the boundary from, uh, from normal to abnormal growth? Another question. Or did large cohort of normal cells undergo this change, each becoming the ancestor of distinct subpopulations of the cells within the tumor cell? There is another thing. The tumors are usually not homogeneous, so there are different cells. 
with different genotypes in a tumor. So is that because of different origins or are they originated from the same cell but during the time they acquire different mutations? So monoclonal or polyclonal? The question is this. Such po a population of cells, all of which derive from common ancestral cell, is said to be monoclonal. So answer is tumors are monoclonal. Cancer cells exhibit an altered energy metabolism. This is the most important thing in today's lecture, actually. Cancer metabolism, very important. And a new subject, a novel subject. Ne yazıyor burada? Cancer cells exhibit uh, altered energy. So what does it mean? How can, be, how can a cell's metabolism be different? The energy metabolism of most cancer cells differ markedly from that of normal cells. What do you understand when I say energy metabolism? So this energy metabolism is different in cancer cells. How different? Normal cells under aerobic conditions. What do normal cells do under normal conditions, aerobic conditions? Normal cell, oxygen present. Uh, normal cells that experience aerobic conditions break down glucose into pyruvates in the cytosol, which is done by glycolytic pathway, glycolysis. And then normal cells dispatch the pyruvates into mitochondria. In the mitochondria, pyruvate is broken down further into carbon dioxide with citric acid cycle or TCA cycle or Krebs cycle. And then normal cells produce 36 ATPs from one glucose. Right? So there is something important here, glucose. How is glucose enter to the cell? We have a special protein for that, GLUT1 protein. So GLUT1 is glucose transporter protein. That's one. We take the glucose inside the cell in the cytoplasm after glycolysis, glycolytic pathway. Peki. Normal cells hypoxic conditions under anaerobic or hypoxic low oxygen conditions. Normal cells are limited to using only glycolysis. Generate pyruvate. Pyruvate is reduced to lactate and lactate is secreted from the cell. Cancer cells. Many types of cancer cells rely largely on glycolysis generating lactates even when exposed to ample oxygen. Most types of normal cells in the body have continuous access to oxygen conveyed by blood. Therefore, they are able to metabolize glucose, the normal cells are able to metabolize glucose through this energetically far more efficient route. Şimdi, the cancer cells metabolize glucose so inefficiently requires them to compensate by importing enormous amounts of glucose. This behavior is seen in many types of cancer cells, including both carcinomas and hematopoietic tumors. Cancer cells express greatly elevated levels of grans uh, glucose transporter, particularly GLUT1. Radiologists take the advantage of this elevated glucose uptake by injecting into circulation radio-labeled glucose and observing its rapid concentration in tumors. Aerobic glycolysis is thought to represent one of the many, uh, many uh, consequences of cell transformation. Aerobic glycolysis, sometimes called Warburg effect, remains a subject of much contention as its Rationalate in cancer cell biology has never been fully resolved. Why do as many as 80% of cancer cells metabolize most of their glucose via glycolysis? When completion of glucose, glucose degradation in mitochondria by the citric acid cycle would afford them vast more ATP to fuel their own growth and proliferation. Is aerobic glycolysis required for maintenance of cancer cell phenotype? Or does it represent nothing more than a side effect of cell transformation that plays no casual role in cell transformation or growth? Okay. The cancer cells within a tumor often have 
inadequate access to oxygen. That's one. The resulting hypoxic state limits cancer cells to glucolysis and thus have inefficient ATP production. Because of Warburg effect, cancer cells would seem to be well adapted to this oxygen starvation since glycolysis operates normally under hypo hypoxic conditions. Still, this fails to explain why cancer cells, even when provided with abundant oxygen, do not take advantage of this oxygen to generate ATP in far larger quantities. Şimdi Another rational. Glycolysis actually serves a second role independent of ATP generation. The intermediates in the glycolytic pathway functions as precursors of many other pathways, many other cellular pathways. For example, production of many other molecules involved in cell growth, including biosynthesis of nucleic acids and lipids. And by blocking the last step of glycolysis, Cancer cells ensure the accumulation of earlier intermediates via feedback reactions by in this pathway. These glycolytic intermediates can then be derived into critical important biosynthetic reactions. Et, this behavior contrasts with that of normal cells. The normal cells are generally not actively pro pro proliferating. They do not require large-scale biosynthetic reactions. They depend large on, largely on ATP to sustain their metabolic activity. By some estimates, normal cells use more than 30% of their imported glucose to make ATP, while cancer cells use only 1% of their glucose for this purpose. How do cancer cells manage avoid mitochondrial processing of glucose metabolites? It's the job for them. Pyruvate kinase, this is an enzyme, as you know, catalyzes the last step of glycolysis. Conversion of phosphoenolpyruvate to pyruvate. Okay? Pyruvate is normally designated for import into mitochondria, where it's broken down into citric acid. In citric acid. There are two isoforms of pyruvate kinase, M1 isoform and M2 isoform. And one isoform of PK typically is expressed in most adult tissues. So PK in the adult tissues uh, is M1 isoform. But there's a second isoform, which is M2, that is expressed by early embryonic cells, rapidly growing normal cells, and cancers. The commonly expressed M1 isoform of PK ensures that pyruvate is dispatched from the cytosol into mitochondria. M2 isoform that is expressed in cancer cells cause pyruvate to be reduced to lactate in the cytosol. The relative to M1 form, the M2 enzyme has very slow turnover number. This results in a backup of glycolytic intermediates and their diversion into biosynthetic pathways. Importantly, relative inactivity of citric acid cycle in cancer cells is not due to defect in mitochondria. They are normal and fully capable of receiving pyruvate and processing it in citric acid cycle. Experimental evidence indicate that the growth of tumors actually depends on expression of M2 and elevated expression of glucose importer, GLOT1. Önemli. Another thing, lactate, lactate de dehydrogenase A, LDH A, lactate dehydrogenase A, bu da pyruvatı lactate çeviren enzim, Bunu da, bu da artıyor. When any one of these are inhibited, tumor growth slows down sometimes dramatically.